Hello, everyone. This is Eric, the Asian movie enthusiast. Tonight, we're going to talk about one of my personal favorite comedy directors of all time, Shinobu Yaguchi. And with me, I have two gentlemen here. We have the man, the myth, the legend, Corey. Say hello, Corey. The man, the myth. Hello. The man, the myth, the legend. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have Ray from Egg I, Man I, Ray. I still get it. I still get emails, guys. Still get emails. <laughs> How are you doing, Ray? I'm doing all right. Uh, it's been a while since I've recorded anything, to be honest. So uh, my speech, my my, uh, I might be stuttering, stumbling on my words a lot during this whole recording. So apologies in advance. And you and those folks listening at home might hear a really energetic child in the background so i apologize for that too so <laughs> it's uh, appropriate <laughs> given the you know the director we're covering and the type of fun movies that he made so yeah she'll add some sure. atmosphere <laughs> but yeah so shinobu yaguchi now uh i don't know about you guys but when i when i first saw <laughs> one of his movies i want to say it was probably swing girls from 2004 and then after that i basically seeked out everything that i could find from him um and you know one of the things that i think that i like the most about him is that he has almost kind of a template for how he likes to do his films but part of that template is to kind of explore certain topics you know and we'll go through them as we cover the film so you might have you know uh, uh, a character who is kind of like not all of, all of that competent, but they're motivated for some reason to explore a particular topic and get better at a particular skill throughout the film. So along the way, I kind of learned stuff along with the main character. And that's one of the things that I, I really like about his stuff. And he incorporates kind of a, uh, a charming family friendly comedy vibe to it. So those are some of the, like the overall reasons why I, I really like this guy. How about you, Corey? What, what are your uh, overall thoughts? Uh, I think he's one of the best directors, to, well, one of the best contemporary directors to come out of Japan because he's directed 10 feature length films. He's done a few um, shorts for like uh, anthology films and stuff. But tonight we're just focusing on the 10 theatrical or feature films, I should say. He's not made a bad film, in my opinion. And there are plenty of Japanese directors that I love and adore that I can say, well, this movie wasn't too good. This movie was terrible with, with this bloke. I can't say he's directed a bad film. Now, there was obviously some movies I like more than others. And I've got, we're going through his filmography chronologically, but I've got a top 10 here because uh, we have 10 movies. And I, I got to tell you, this is kind of interchangeable. Um, very similar to you, Eric, with how I discovered him. Mine was Water Boys. That was the first movie I saw, which was that movie's got to be over 20 years old now, which makes me feel well, I am an old man, technically. <laughs> I feel so old knowing that that movie's like, was that 2001? Water Boys? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. That's, <laughs> uh, I'm so old. Um, that movie's over 20 years old, and that was the first one that I saw. And then after that, I tried to seek things out. And obviously that was, like I said, 20 years ago and in Australia. I think the only other movie I saw of his at that point was uh, Adrenaline Drive. And then obviously Swim Girls came out after that. And were, yeah, and I've just been a massive fan of the guy ever since. There's the last couple he's directed, um, Survival Family and Dance With Me, I've only I caught uh, recently um, but I'll give you my thoughts on them as we go through but yeah overall one of the best contemporary Japanese directors and definitely a master of the slice of life um, comedy genre so yeah what about you Ray? Um, Waterboys was my my introduction uh, and it was during it was in it was in university um, our Japanese class held a movie night or was a class or club i was a part of both uh, our jap um our japanese our japan club not japanese club sorry our japan club japan culture club held a movie night uh as an event to you know kind of recruit more members and just introduce more people recruit people yeah 
introduce more people into the club and therefore into maybe hopefully the Japanese language program. Um, and the movie they decided to play, I think it was um, during April Fools. They decided to put this movie on for as an April Fools event because it's it was like one of the professor's favorite comedies. It was Water Boys. And that was my introduction to it, uh, to, to Yaguchi. And, and soon after that, I think uh, it was Swing Girls. Right after that, I think uh, it was for a, a Japanese cinema class, cinema literature class, different professor, but still kind of within the same network. Um, and uh, we, uh, that was my second in, uh, my second venture into Yaguchi. And I, I, I didn't realize they were the same director. They were done by the same director at first until they point out the similar styles. Oh, this is like Water Boys, but with girls. It's like, like, like uh, you get these, these group of youths out of their element trying to do something. And what made those movies unique to me is that they actually trained the actors to actually do the stuff that they were portraying on TV. So I thought that was quite unique. And so ever since then, and uh, I moved to Japan shortly after watching those two movies. Um, I tried to seek out as much Yaguchi as I could. And ever since coming, I've caught, I think the majority of the movies that have come out in the theaters after I've come in the, in the cinemas. So I was lucky enough to be able to experience that um, with uh, fellow fans. And I think the first movie I watched in the theaters was Woodjob. And that was quite fun. Yeah, that was a fun experience. Um, can I just yeah. say, can I just say, Ray? What's up? Your discovery of Shinobi Yaguchi sounds like a Shinobi Yaguchi film. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it does, doesn't it? You went, you went to, you're like, you're an American that went to Japan to like go to Japanese class, and you like discovered this. Yeah, I just think that's that's, that's a movie that he would make. That's exactly the sort of wood job. It sounds like actually. <laughs> Yeah, basically. <laughs> so we're going to go through chronologically. Now, right before we do that, right, I think uh, I think it's a good time, Corey, before we crack into the movies, maybe to discuss mm. some, some projects you've been working on right now. Oh, yeah. People have, well, people, like I mentioned earlier, people still message me and send me, uh, if, you, if you want to message me, you can follow me on Instagram. I do have an Instagram. It's just my name, uh, Corey Hinshin. Uh, Eric might be able to put mm -hmm. that in somewhere later on. Yeah. Um, but I've obviously, I don't do YouTube anymore. Too busy with work, life, things like that. But I've been working on a film for over a year now. And it's, it's in post-production. It's almost finished with the editing phase. Um, it's a horror film called Bliss of Evil, a, an Australian, uh, I guess you could call it an exploitation film, but I, I, I don't want to really lump it in with that because it's definitely not a silly B movie. It, it's actually got quite a lot of uh, meat to it, particularly with the plot and the characters and things, but it is low budget Aussie horror, just we tried to elevate it a bit to make it not so schlocky. Uh, uh, kind of make a movie where you actually like the characters. Uh, I am in the film. I act in the film. I written some of the songs for the film. I've got to record some of the songs for the film, like in this post production phase. But um, yeah, Eric, I'm going to send you the latest poster if you want to share it for people to see. Mm -hmm. And if you look very closely, you might see somebody very uh, familiar on that poster. May or may not be me, um, but you guys <laughs> will work it out. Yeah, I'll definitely. Even I, I'm, I'm the I'm the pretty girl on the poster. Just <laughs> yeah, spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah, I'll throw the post. I'll also put the poster on my uh, community tab too on my YouTube channel as well. Even that'd be fantastic. Thank you. But yeah, guys, we're hoping to have this thing completed around June. I can't promise anything uh, as for distrib distribution. That'll all depend on whoever picks up the movie or whatever. But I think it's definitely for, for a low budget or, or no budget, technically, uh, Aussie horror movie made during COVID and lockdowns. Uh, I think we did pretty good. I've seen the, the 
the rough cut or the assembly cut, and I'm pretty happy with it personally. Mm, right. yes. mm. One of these days, I should make a movie. It would be like a like a low budget Kyoshi Kurosawa movie is the one that I would probably make. You know? Oh yeah. But uh, so let's crack into Yaguchi here. Now, apparently, he did like a. Uh, a Pia Film Festival film called The Rain Woman back in 1990, but that's so that's not available anywhere. So he we're going to talk very young when he made that too. Yeah, so we're going to talk about Down the Drain first from 1993, and in this one, you have a schoolgirl subjected to Murphy's Law as she's struck with some really bad luck that launches her into a series of misadventures. Now this one. Oh, and also a fun fact, Noboto Iguchi, the director of Machine Girl, apparently uh, had a side acting gig in this. <laughs> so I wasn't looking for him when I saw this movie before, but I guess if you look for him, he's in there. Um, one thing about this one, I think Yaguchi was still finding his stride with this one, in my opinion. It's a little bit, little bit slow, a little bit uneventful at times, um, but... This character, it's just funny watching somebody have like the worst day ever <laughs> in a comedy form. And that's kind of what we get here. Um, and we'll, we'll, I could talk about a few individual scenes after you guys talk, but uh, I did feel there was, there was one scene near the end that I thought was a little bit inappropriate, but- uh, I know the one you're talking about. Yeah, I know that you're talking about. Yeah, I was too. like, I, uh, I don't know talking. about that one, but, uh, but yeah, overall, I think it was a pretty good, pretty good flick. What do you think, uh, Corey? Yeah, I think for, uh, obviously we haven't seen the other movie, but for the purpose of this discussion, we'll just say that this is his debut film. Um, I think it's solid. Obviously, it is independent. It's micro budget. I do give it a pass on certain things for that. There are continuity errors. I picked up so many watching it. Um, you can see the cameraman in, a, in the reflection of like uh, windows and things quite a bit and stuff like that. But that shouldn't be the focus. The story, it's almost like it felt to me like that this was almost like a university like thesis project. Mm. That's that's the the vibe I got from it. Like. It was almost like he, he shot a short film and then he put a bunch, it feels like a, a bunch of short films with kind of like the same character. Um, that there's not really an overarching story. It's like she gets in this situation and that story ends and then she gets into this situation, that story ends and it just kind of uh, follows. Um, I liked the, the main actress in this. I thought she did a very good job. Uh, some of the things that stood out to me were just the um, the the way she's treated um, as a female, and I think Gucci does write very strong female characters. Uh, he obviously gets better as he go goes along, but for like a you know a, a teenage girl in Japan, uh, she's let's just say she's not very orthodox. She she comes across to her friends as this prude, but she's not really. And that's what kind of, I guess, uh, starts the spiral of the story. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's worth checking out. I wouldn't like recommend it as the first film of his. I know it's his like first film and it is available. You can watch this thing on YouTube, but I wouldn't watch this. As, I wouldn't recommend this as an introduction to him as a filmmaker it's kind of like one of those movies if you like his other stuff and you haven't seen this then you should probably check it out what about you ray yeah this uh, i totally agree with Corey. it was definitely the most i mean obviously it was his first movie as you said uh, eric he was still trying to find his stride <clears throat> you can see kind of um the seeds of his style kind of um blooming or blossoming if you will in this movie still not quite fully developed yet but there um as far as like where his quirky uh, if you will sense of humor uh, is coming from and yeah that see it towards the end was just probably the only part i wasn't i was just i just thought was inappropriate and the way they tried to just 
how do you say, concluded that part of the story was just, it just felt I think awesome. it made it worse. It made it worse, yeah. It was just like, mm. all right, so we're just going to forget about that and just have a happy ending. Yeah. All right. <laughs> you know, it's like, it was the 90s. Maybe humor was different back then. I don't know. It could be a, it could be a pro- product of the times. <clears throat> I'm not sure about Japanese, Japan during, as far as our humor is, humor is concerned in the early 90s. But uh, yeah, actually, you know, um, if you look at, I think, uh, the Wikipedia page or even Asian, Asian Wiki, it does list uh, Noboru Iguchi there. But if you look at the Japanese Wikipedia page, he's nowhere to be found, mm. his name. Um, so I was looking up for him too. Like I rewatched it too. And I was like, I don't see anybody that looks like, or even in the credits, I didn't even see his name listed. I at least couldn't catch it. Hmm. But um, what is it? Yeah, the, I thought everything else other than that last part it had its it was unique and it had its own identity it was definitely um you can see like what i like about Yagu, i don't know yaguchi is like not only his comedy and sense of humor but the way he tells a fish out of water story like kind of like stuff stuff the, all the worst things that could happen just starts happening and just how the the, the main characters interact with him um and it's usually comedic a comedic result and that's exactly what happens in this movie. Just the worst thing just starts happening one thing after the next. And she and she just moves on to each story like like turning the page in a, in, in, in a multi-chapter novel. It's it's like, okay, so we're here now. All right. Oh, oh we're we're in this we're in this area now. Uh, all right. <laughs> it just kept getting worse and worse. And it's like <laughs> it just it, it just turned into kind of fun nonsense by the end mm-hmm. i enjoyed it mm-hmm. until that part of the end but yeah yeah uh, as I think the, not the humor for the, movie, I would, yeah the humor that? for this one's a bit like i don't even know if you do you call it like obviously it's dark humor where i think his later films are a bit lighter we're like the, yeah. the scene we're talking about and if you've seen the film you know what ray eric and i i meant know what we're talking about um I guess we should explain it for people that might be confused. Mm -hmm. There's a scene where our main character, who we've been following throughout all these farces, like she goes from like uh, using her friend's train ticket on the train and then the, uh, I think it's her teacher finds her like uh, dirty photos with her older boyfriend and then she loses the ashes of her grandfather and then it just goes ridiculous what happens but then there's this scene where there's this older woman that's kind of taken her under her wing in one of the previous episodes i would say and it turns out that she's takes young high school girls to this pimp in this town and our lead character gets raped and it's played for laughs Mm-hmm. But she stabs the guy in the ass with a with a fork. With a fork, yeah, yeah. And then at the end, the the movie ends all like she's really happy and stuff, and she has a baby. And we can infer that the baby is from the rape, but it's done comedically, and it's really it bad. <laughs> it's like you don't don't know how to feel about it you're like hmm like like ray was saying like maybe that was acceptable comedy in the early 90s in japan and maybe as westerners we're looking at it from a westerner's perspective and we're going hmm that shit doesn't float in 2022 but we're talking about a 30 year old film but yeah just so you guys know that's what we're talking about yeah it, it yeah it really goes kind of off the rails with that story that plot line which i it's one of the things i really dislike about the movie but other than that it's great yeah yeah that's something i would expect to see in like a hong kong movie of that time Mm. like a category three film (laughs) yeah yeah category three comedy Mm. or something so all Mm. right we're moving on to my secret cash which i just recently figured out had it had the name the secret garden <laughs> i was looking for yes. it online i'm like what's the secret garden what did he do a sequel to my well, the secret, secret cash? garden's a isn't that an old kid's book from like 
they made a movie like of that in the nineties, right? This something like that, yeah. Mm. I don't know. Um, I remember my sisters used to watch the shit out of that. <clears throat> so I, my, I remember that. I remember that movie too. It's like a little secret... girl who just yeah. And I just I'll stop. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> I'll stop it. I'll stop it. <laughs> My secret cash was from 97. So after a mm. money crazed girl is kidnapped by bank robbers, she becomes obsessed with finding the missing cash, which lies in a treacherous woodland area. And this stars uh, Naomi Nishida, who some people might recognize from Happiness of the Katakuris. She was pretty funny in that one. And this one, this one I think is Shin- Yaguchi's like style, like template is even more kind of forming here. You get the person who is a uh, <clears throat> kind of a, I don't know what you'd call it. Like, uh, I think, what do they call it? Rags to riches or something. They called it on Wikipedia. It's not uh, not entirely accurate, but kind of um, someone who is just a normal everyday person gets motivated to learn things in order to achieve a certain mm-hmm. goal. And so it, it's just like a movie like this. I don't know. It just feels different from a typical comedy. Because a lot of it's just like everyday stuff. This girl's like, okay, I got to get this bag of cash that I remember being somewhere in the forest. And at the beginning of the film, the whole series of events is, is quite funny and how she, uh, uh, she gets like kidnapped from the bank robbery. The robbers take her out into the woodland area. Crap goes down and like the cash gets lost, but she gets saved like uh, uh, down river basically. So she knows the cash is out there. And she wants to get it. So she's got to study all of these things to try to like get out there, like, uh, you know, diving and stuff like that. You know, how to survive in the, uh, how to like uh, scale like rock formations and stuff. And that's your movie. Like in a typical film with a missing bag of cash, usually it's like a madcap crazy, like uh, everybody's going for the cash the whole film. But this girl's just, mm. she's trying to learn skills to to, to get it. So I, it's really kind of uh it really kind of establishes this director's style for his future stuff. And it's, it's easy to see why his stuff is just a little bit, it's a little bit different. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, what are your thoughts, Corey? Yeah, I agree. And it's, it establishes his style. Um, this is a uh, spoiler alert for later on. This is my least favorite of his films. Um, yeah. Mainly because I think, he the template's there you're not wrong 100 percent. the template is there for the future films you can see he's taken what he learned from uh, down the drain he's done this film my secret cash and he's like okay i'm gonna the things that worked in my first film i'm gonna bring over to this film and then he clearly had the idea of the rags to riches or zero to hero uh uh kind of yeah the, the the plot device he uses for most of his films. Um, but the issue, I think, with this one, I'm not, again, I don't think this is a bad film. I don't think the main character is very likable, where in his other films, I find that the, um, the main character is somewhat more likable, uh, where this, the, the lead character here, our main protagonist, she's obsessed with money. Like, it's just money, 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 money. That's all she cares about. She gets a job at a bank because when she's a kid, she's obsessed with money. She likes counting money. Then she gets the job at the bank. And again, she just sits there and counts money all day. So she's happy and dreams of having lots of money. And unlike other movies that he's made, the motivation for this one, I think, is just very... It's a bit more self-centred. It's like she doesn't really... There's not much of a character arc for this... For this woman, um, she, she is obsessed with money. Uh, gets kidnapped by bank robbers. They put her in the boot of a car, and then she somehow miraculously survives this crash. And then the money falls to the lake, and then hijinks, you know, like any Yaguchi film. Um, and then I, I did like her having to learn things like learning how to swim, learning how to dive, uh, learning basic uh, geography and. She's like, you know, she goes to uni and does all these cool things. The motivation at the end of the day is literally to get a shitload of money. And I don't think there's a character arc there. I think it's just, I'm obsessed with money. At the end of the movie, I'm obsessed with money. Mm-hmm. Like, what, what did we learn from this? Why are we here? 
Um, but yeah, I, I again, I don't think it's a bad film. I think it has merit because you do see the beats and you see the template. But I think the issue with this one, for me, per, like every, people might disagree with me, that's fine. But um, yeah, I just think the lead character is just not very likable. Anyway, your thoughts, right? Yeah, I agree. Like her, she was kind of a one-dimensional character, but for some reason, for me, that was kind of that kind of gave her a bit of charm. Like she was constantly just deadpanning, and just really awkward. Like mm -hmm. I don't know, like really awkward and quirky, and just like she like um, yeah. For me, that's just what gave it this movie and the character her charm. It's like oh, I want to get like I'm just obsessed with counting money. I just love it when I count money. It's the weird, the weirdest the weirdest kind of concept you can have and, and it's like and then she gets she gets caught she gets uh, kidnapped in a bank robbery for no real reason other than just to move the plot along and she loses the the money in the bottom of a lake and then she's like i want to go there she, she strings along her family tries to get it there she realizes okay i need i need to find another way I, learns that she needs um or here's a documentary on tv from a professor at a university so she's like ah teach me how to get there oh you should just become a student okay if i can become a student i can get there okay okay so i'll learn oh i need to learn how to swim too okay i'll teach i'll take swimming lessons oh i guess i need to learn how to rock climb too i'll take a rock climb it almost reminded me of forrest gump for a moment like yeah this <laughs> this, this awkward person who really like no i, I wouldn't say i wouldn't call forrest gump a one-dimensional character at all but it's just kind of like they realize um, they want to do something, and then they just like go with the flow, and then just and then they for some reason whatever they do they accomplish they, their accomplishments are like high like big like they come with huge acclaim. It's like she becomes like a world class level rock climber, even goes to Australia. Yeah, she, she goes to Australia for one. I'm like, oh okay. She like climbs as rock. And I'm like, all right. I know. It's, it's like. <laughs> So random, and then she's like, "Okay, I'm done with this." And it's like, and then she has this rival that's just constantly jealous of her, and like yeah. this uh, one of the professors at the university is just constantly tailing her. And but then they can just kind of drop that angle like midway through. I wish they could have followed through with it till the very end. But like, I yeah, for me, like, yeah, it's not my it's not it's not my favorite uh, Yaguchi movie by far, but I do appreciate the quirkiness of the story. I just where just the random hijinks that the main character gets strung along with, strung along to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And his next film also involves stolen cash. She did two in a row involving <laughs> stolen cash. Uh, and that is Adrenaline Drive from 1999. Uh, a guy and girl decide to steal 200 million yen from the Yakuza. All right, and this stars Masanobu Ando, which a lot of people know from Battle Royal. Battle Royale. Yeah. Yep, yep. And um, yeah, there's this one again. I think this one is maybe a little bit stronger, in my opinion, than the My Secret Cash. It has like, I don't know, like these a lot of times these Japanese movies aren't like, like you hear the uh, adrenaline drive. This is going to be like freaking like high octane, like action comedy, you know what I mean? But it's no, no, <laughs> it's it's kind of, um, you know, he he focuses again on kind of the uh, the realism of, of the scenario, and then he throws in some bits of like insanity uh, within it. So there's a uh, one of my favorite scenes in this one is where they they actually literally launder the money at a public laundromat mm. <laughs> to wash the blood <laughs> off of all the money that they stole. And then uh, I <clears throat> I like the subplot involving the yakuza boss who's in the hospital for a little while mm. recovering and he's causing the nurses all kinds of havoc and then you have his minions who are like a bunch of like goofy like uh, enforcers and they're they're not doing a very good job of tracking down uh, ando after he leaves town with the girl but i like how it all kind of comes together during the last half hour you get a little you know little bits of like action and chases that are mixed in and it's uh yeah, it's just how it, it, this film's very. It feel, just feels very Japanese to me, and in, in the execution of of creating a film that's not like that high octane uh, action comedy type stuff. It just has like a a charm to it. Um, yeah. So, what do you think, Corey? Yeah, I agree. Um, this is definitely leaps and bounds better than the the previous two films. 
and I think this what is this was this the first studio film for him? I'm not sure. This clearly had a this clearly had a much bigger budget than the previous. Obviously, the first film was micro budget. The second one might have had a little bit more money, but this one felt to me like it was clearly his first, I guess, big studio film. Something that he had a bigger budget to play with. I really like Adrenaline Drive. Uh, I agree with you, Eric. The title doesn't really sell the movie at all. You, it's like Need for Speed or um, yeah. Fast and the Furious. It sounds like a knockoff of, of one of those, you know, Adrenaline Drive. And it stars, I don't know, what's Clint Eastwood's son's name? Some like, you know, Scott Eastwood in Adrenaline Drive. It sounds like something like that you see on, a, on yeah, Amazon right? Prime and Netflix, right? Uh, yeah, this movie's great. I really like it. Uh, I the thing is, you said it's it's 1999, and I watched this movie again recently to prepare for this because this was my bright idea doing this thing. By the way, um, it felt very 1999. Like this is a late 90s movie through and through like whether it's Japanese or not if this was made in Australia or the US it's 100% like yep this is a late 90s movie this is a post Tarantino post Lockstock you know uh, Guy Ritchie movie Uh, that's that's the vibe I got from watching it again like even though it is Japanese it felt like the Japanese trying to do that Mm-hmm. very post Tarantino post Guy Ritchie that little nook in the 90s is like about 97 to 99 we had movies like Go and um, uh, Suicide Kings and all these kind of like US films that were trying to emulate that Tarantino style and that's if you want to see like a Japanese movie that has that style but isn't shit watch a channel and drive <laughs> <laughs> if you if you like like if you like you know if you're you know and you're in your 30s early 40s um, you remember that time period you probably get a lot out of it um, and if you you're a big fan of battle royale like I am again it was interesting um, seeing the actor you know play a bit of a loser like he's just this guy who uh, delivers high cards for a living. And he gets in, gets into an accident um, with Yakuza. And then again, like every Yaguchi film, there's like this little basic thing that happens to a regular person and it just sets this farce in motion. Um, yeah, I love Adrenaline Drive. I highly recommend it. Right? Yeah, I dug it too. Um, what is it? Uh... I like how this time we had two central characters instead of one. So that way we can, we actually had two, two uh, characters, to, a, a lead relationship to kind of follow along instead of just like one character dealing with, um, you know, one hijinks after another. Um, this one actually had a pair and the way they interacted with each other and the way they both as a pair interacted with, or reacted to the hijinks that were, the, the the insanity that was happening around them although i gotta say my favorite characters were the group of thugs of the the little um crone cronies of the, the main yakuza guy just because every time they came in they oh they just had me they just had me in stitches they just they broke to the guy's house oh it's open yeah let's just like let's just chill yeah maybe we should just like take the money for ourselves, you know? And then <laughs> they find, like, one of the thugs just ends up finding the guy hiding behind a curtain by just finding a random bandage on the floor and just decides to roll it up. Just, like, why would anyone do that? <laughs> you know, just, even, like, even when they're in the hospital, they're just, they're just talking about the boss. <laughs> just saying, the boss can clearly hear them. It's like, yeah, we, like, why do we have to listen? Let's just take the money for ourselves. We don't have anything to lose anymore. <laughs> Like they're just hilarious in every scene that they were in for me. They, for that, for me, they made the majority of the comedy of the movie. Um, and yeah, I think uh, I enjoyed the relationship between um, between Ando and the main girl. Uh, what's her name? Ishida, 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 something. Ishida, something. And then um, what is it? 
I like how they they go like they go from total strangers to kind of awkward and then they're kind of like you know they let themselves loose in luxury it's like yeah let's just like mm-hmm. run away let's just buy let's just stay in the suite you know whatever we got they come into this nice hotel dressed in in rags and just feel felt like really just dirty and the the hotel staff is just like i i don't think we got any room for you and then she just pops up her money on the desk it's like no we got money give us a seat and um they get themselves made up and like even get their money like um or she gets her money stolen once and that led to a pretty hilarious scene when she was just running yeah, that's, uh, that's across. really funny that was a funny scene and then that that was the catalyst that kind of continue with the chase but between the chase scenes um i felt it c- kind of dragged a little bit I, I understand it was for character building you know you want to get to know these characters and you want them to get to know each other too but then it totally as you guys had already mentioned it kind of, kind of went against the title of adrenaline drive and the the, the, the title is the same in japanese too oh <laughs> it's exactly really the name. <laughs> it's called like it's just pronounced in in the japanese <laughs> pronunciation it's called adrenaline drive uh, but yeah like um when it was actually when the adrenaline when the adrenaline scenes were there it was it was fun it was a lot of fun uh and it it, it was like um i often I, I i found myself often just like come on just just go 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 you know and it, it was it was really fun for that you know um and I like the way it all tied up at the end. I thought um, the way everything tied up at the end was really fun. Yes, this is a good one. For some, this is one adrenaline drives one where like I, <clears throat> for some reason I, I feel like watching it on a fairly regular basis. Mm. It's like uh, one of those. But and then we have his first big one. All right, Water Boys from two thousand and one. So mm-hmm. after a beautiful lady becomes the new coach for a synchronized swimming team a failed speed swimmer decides to join and uh, him and a bunch of dudes join in. So this one stars Satoshi Sumabuki, who I love, Hiroshi Tamaki and Naoto Takanaka. (laughs) And we we all love that guy. And um, I would say, to be honest, I I think I've, I've seen this movie three times. First two times I saw it, I liked it. I didn't, I didn't love it. But the, when I rewatched it a week ago, Again, it, it really clicked for me this time. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, not sure what it was. Maybe because it's not schoolgirls learning jazz. It's, it's schoolboys <laughs> that are half naked the whole I don't know. But uh, I, I don't know. I just really, uh, it really absorbed me this last time I watched it. Um, the, I would have to say like um, the opening 15 minutes of this movie are pretty unpredictable. Like it just, it, mm. it's actually pretty wild. Because if you take the template of a film like this, that that lady teacher's there the whole film in a typical film like this. And and these guys join the synchronized swimming team and she's like, see ya, I'm pregnant, bye. <laughs> and these guys are like, what the heck? And now they're stuck, uh, you know, doing this uh, sync team thing. So now they got to figure out a way how to learn how to synchronize swim. You know, and our, our boy, Naoto Takanaka, he, he helps them out at some point. He's... He's great in this. He works at a uh, what was Sea World, and his uh, yeah. <laughs> he trains, he the, trains dolphins. the dolphins. And so apparently that is uh, a prerequisite for teaching dudes how to synchronize swim. <laughs> so there's a lot of really good stuff in this in this one. I like the fish scene where they uh, they screw up and kind of uh, I guess uh, put a, a bunch of fish's lives in danger. Um, <clears throat> oh, my favorite scene in the movie though. <clears throat> near the second half the cops show up like the ambulances show up on a beach and you're like you're looking around like why would somebody call the ambulances or the or the cops to show up on the beach and you see like the news story and they were trying to sink swim in the ocean and everybody thought they were drowning i thought that was just phenomenal so and this has the uh you know the shinobu yaguchi big big finale which goes on for quite a long time and it's pretty pretty awesome so i could see why this was like his bit first like big hit and i do appreciate it more now than i did previously so what are your thoughts Corey? yeah as i said earlier this is my first film and i love it 
um, this is the this is the first one that really gets that template right. The when you talk about a Yaguchi film, it's like this is the film you expect. Uh, like you said, Eric, it just moves like this every like five seconds. It's like, oh, okay, this is happening. Oh, this is happening now. Oh, okay, and it it did a really great great job. If you're if you're a fan of just slice of life in general, uh, I don't know what happened in the last couple of years. Probably because I'm an old I, I'm becoming I'm an old man. I should get a walking cane soon. Um, I've really with the content that I watch now, uh, obviously people that know me from when I had my YouTube channel, I mean, you, you two know this better than anyone, but I, I really like dark stuff, uh, like my serial killer movies, thrillers and things like that. And I reviewed a lot of that back in the day. Uh, as I get older, maybe just, you know, life experience and stuff, I've, I found myself just starting to really get into Japanese slice of life stuff and really open it. You know, 10, 15 years ago, I'd be like, I'm not going to watch this slice of life anime about teenage girls that start a high school band or an anime club like the shirt I'm wearing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to watch Death Note <laughs> and Berserk. I'm going to watch stuff for boys. Um, but yeah, I think if you're a fan of, you know, the typical slice of life anime in that genre or, or the manga then i think water boys is kind of like i mean oh, he does this better in some other films that one one in particular we'll talk about in a minute but it feels like you're watching it an excellent slice of life anime in a live action version but it wasn't actually based on a manga um the characters are fantastic it's really funny this movie is hilarious like Eric mentioned some of the funny scenes earlier, but then you've got stuff like when they're swimming with the dolphins and you think they've killed the dolphins and then they try to resuscitate the dolphin. I was like almost on the floor laughing. Um, and the comedy's there from the start to the very end. Like the way the film ends is on like a comedic moment where um, he's lost his swimming trunks. And his girlfriend throws him, you know, the thing to wear. And it's just like, it's just funny throughout. Uh, yeah, I, I, again, this is the, the typical Yaguchi film where you've got this guy who's a bit of a loser. He's not, not a very good swimmer. He doesn't really make the cut of the team. Uh, suddenly this beautiful teacher comes along and he wants to do synchronized swimming. And then he gets stuck in it. And then, you know, again, hijinks and come along. And then there's this big competition that they've got to enter in. And, you know, we're going to talk about Swing Girls in a minute, but this is kind of like the precursor to Swing Girls. I think he takes this formula and then he kind of perfects it in Swing Girls, which we'll talk about shortly. But yeah, Water Boys, this kind of has a soft spot in my heart because it was the first Gucci film that I saw. Um, again, I watched it recently uh, in preparation for this and I, my thoughts have not changed. I still love it. The only issue I think I have with the movie is the girlfriend character. Mm. I don't think she's very fleshed out. She kind of just pops up. Mm -hmm. And when she, her entrance to the film, again, it feels like a slice of life anime where it's like, is this a dream sequence or not? And then, oh, okay, she is your girlfriend. And then it's very, their relationship's very confusing. Yeah. And, and I don't think they establish that relationship very well or, yeah, they needed to flush it out a bit. But that's my only gripe with the movie. Everything else, I can't be fault. Anyway, Ray, you mentioned that this is the first one that you saw as well. Yeah, it's the very first one. And it's the one that made me fall in love with Yaguchi. Like, uh, I haven't seen it in a while but i remember it like i remember almost every moment a moment that's just how much it meant to me for me my favorite scene was you know at first you know they're constantly bickering like the the what is it, five main dudes right mm -hmm. um like they had all the other guys who just kind of 
join because they want to they like the cute teacher but then they all leave in the very beginning leaving only the five main guys to kind of just carry the team and keep the club alive right um and they're still bickering they're still trying to not only learn how to swim but also just learn how to swim as a team but and you know you uh once they were under the guidance of uh takenaka's character um, he tries to ditch them. He just tries to get free labor for them, basically. That's what made his character hilarious. It's like, oh yeah, okay, I'll teach you here. Just clean the walls of the aquarium, right? Or <laughs> of the fish tanks, right? And then I'll, I'll take you to the dance dance machine. At the yes, arcade. that was the moment that got me because during at the time, I was heavily into playing Dance Dance Revolution, competitively even too. And that moment stuck to me. It's like, you see them all just dancing in unison. <laughs> <laughs> to a, an impromptu dance routine and 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 you see Takaraka come back because he, he realizes that he needs the cash that he lent the boys to play games so he can get gas for his car <laughs> so like and then just having him stumble upon that scene for him and us the audience it was for me it, that that's what struck um the hardest just because you know I was like I said I was playing DDR heavily like at the time uh and I absolutely love that scene, how it all came together. And from that point on, you see like their team are kind of finally coming together in the way they, um, and the, like, uh, and eventually leading to the whole team coming back and leading up to the climactic ending. Um, but yeah, I, um, the, um, all the characters were amazing. I love Tamaki's character, how he started off with an Afro, then it get, gets burnt when his, uh, <laughs> when the CD player just explodes in his face, you know? <laughs> That was hilarious. That's just a hilarious concept. It's like, here's this dude with a fro and it's, <laughs> it's gone. Because it, it was all to set up that joke. <laughs> and I was, I was fine with that. And uh, yeah, everything. And then you had the, the, got, the, the gay teammate who was in love with him. And you had like those mm -hmm. kinds of guys going off on the side too. And yeah, everything about the characters, the performances, the, everything uh, still sticks with me to this day. Yes, yes. And now we've come, <clears throat> now we've come to uh, one of my favorite comedies of all time, ever, from any country. And that is Swing Girls from 2004. Let's so get a group of flunky schoolgirls take up jazz. It's basically your premise. And they, uh, <laughs> at the beginning of the movie, they basically take out the whole like band by like, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> basically uh delivering the their lunches right and then they uh mishandle them in transport and then the whole band gets food poisoning so uh they're basically like forced to try to learn some music and then you know obviously kind of similar to uh to water boys like that kind of reverts back where the band comes back oh we don't need you anymore but the the the, the taste of the music and the, it gets to them you know what i mean they get really interested in it and I, I really, uh, <clears throat> this is another one where you kind of learn uh, a little bit as you go through the film as well, you know, around uh, the type of music that they're studying and doing. And then they, uh, it really feels like they, it took them, these characters a while to kind of learn the music. It, do, it doesn't happen, you know, at the drop of a hat. And I know I've read or heard that the, uh, a lot of the actors actually did learn to play the instruments as well. <clears throat> Also, I think when I was looking on Yes Asia, I think there might be a, a, an OST of this, an actual soundtrack mm -hmm. a CD, which I, I might end up purchasing if it's still available. Because uh, the music was actually really good, especially during the big finale. Because they play a few songs that you might not have been expecting, uh, uh, you know, based on what they were doing throughout the film. And it's this one's just a, uh, I mean, I love uh, Jury Ueno in this. I think she's fantastic. Um, and uh, Takanaka, of course, shows up again, and he's awesome, <laughs> as always. But yeah, this is, I don't know, it's just something about, when I first saw this, it was like, it, it, it really hammers home that almost every time I watch a movie from this director, when I'm done, I'm in a good mood. Like, almost every single yeah. time. And that's, I think that's like a huge positive uh, for him. So what do you think about this one, Corey? Swing Girls. It puts you in a good mood. That's for sure. I, this is one of those movies when it ends and the credits start rolling, I could just 
hit play again and just watch it again. And I could say that about maybe half the movies in this list, to be honest. Um, yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head where this, like I was, I was talking earlier, you know, trying to watch much lighter things, considering I just watch so much dark shit, um, you know, when I have my channel and just personally, and it's like you, it, these movies put a smile on your face, you feel good, but it's not done in like a cheesy, like hallmark movie of the week way where it's, you know, it's all sappy. And it's just, they're just so well written. Uh, they're very funny. Uh, I, I love this movie. Again, as somebody, you know, who grew up playing instruments and learning guitar and drums and stuff as a teenager, I think I kind of, this resonated a bit better with me because I remember being like a complete amateur trying to like learn how to play stuff myself. So seeing these girls in a position where they just kind of are thrown into it like every other Yaguchi film through an crazy antics and, and you've got these girls that are kind of, they want to join the jazz group so they can get out of doing math, basically. They, they just want to like do something very cruisy and easy and they think they can just, I guess, take the piss um, and not have to do the work. And, and they, they try and then they, the lead character, she really quite enjoys it. And she, um, she pawns her sister's, is it a PlayStation 1 that she's got? Or is it a place? Oh, it's a PlayStation 2, sorry, I think. So it must have been yeah. just as the PlayStation 2 was coming out. She, she liked the PlayStation 2 and the TV and she swaps it for this like terrible, like rusty old saxophone. Um, and like Eric said, you don't feel like she just picks up the saxophone and then two minutes later, she's an expert. Like her and her, you know, again, similar to Waterboys, there's like a group of like five girls, you know, um, there's those two delinquent girls, the the uh, the bass player and the guitarist that also join, and their ex boyfriends. They, they help them make their instruments and stuff. And like every Gucci film, there's there's the beats, you know. There's there's the high point, and then there's the low point. And and again, even the low point from this just comes from something really silly, like forgetting to submit an application for something. Um, and, you know, you got the, the ending. Again, like I said, I, I mentioned this when we talk about, talk about Waterboys. It's like you took Waterboys and said, I think I can do this better, even though Waterboys is great. Um, and even with the Takanaka uh, character, he's playing a very similar character that he did in Waterboys. In this, he's playing the teacher, I guess. Um, and like he did in Waterboys where... He's like, yeah, I'll teach you how to synchronize swim. He's teaching you these girls jazz, yet he can't even, he's in a beginner's jazz class that he tries to keep secret from everyone. And he has little kids yelling at him because he's so terrible. <laughs> yet he's, you know, the teaching these girls jazz. Um, but I like, I liked his character moments. And again, he was very funny. And then like him showing up at the end, you know, at the, um, Again, and very similar beats to what happens in Water Boys as well. You know, the coach turns up at the end to watch them, etc. Um, but this is kind of, I guess, if you're new to this, guys, uh, maybe if you're watching this, you, you might not be new to this guy's films. And I'm sorry that we've spoiled everything for you. But if I was to recommend a Yaguchi film to like just anyone, uh, I would, I would probably pick this. Maybe this or Wood Job. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Depends on my mood. But I think if you gave anyone this movie, even if they don't like watching subtitles or you know whatever, whatever bullshit excuse they give you, I, I don't believe anyone can dislike this film. <laughs> Personally, I, I just think it's one of those movies where it's just fantastic. Anyway, Ray, your turn. I uh, absolutely agree with 100% of what both of you guys have said. Um, it struck a chord with me too because uh, like uh, throughout junior high school, high school, I was in the school marching band. So I know, I, I know the beats, you know, no pun intended. I know the beats of 
what it is of learning an instrument and seeing these girls go through those same beats even like even when it was just like to to be substitutes and then they find a genuine love for playing music that was that was the heart of this movie for me like like all right i guess we'll do it you know hey you know guys like the, the band's back but this is kind of fun i kind of still want to keep going uh and then the friends like you know me too so they 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 try to do all, everything all these odd jobs they can to get money to afford instruments like pawning off a playstation 2 tv searching for mushrooms in the wilderness and getting chased by wild boars in the process uh what was um even performing uh, working at a supermarket and performing uh their music in front of said supermarket to make some extra cash um just doing everything they can because they genuinely love the music and then you had takanaka's character like you know he like sim- uh, as you said he's a similar character to how he was in water boys uh where he inadvertently teaches the main characters what they aim to do he doesn't really teach by well in water boys he didn't really teach by choice in this one he kind of gave them indirect guidance i guess like he gave them guidance in terms of like what he knows about music in ter- uh, from his love of the genre, but not from his own expertise with the instrument. Mm-hmm. He just tells them, you got to feel this way, you got to feel it. He doesn't actually give them any technical advice. The girls, I think, eventually, dis- if I remember correctly, they, dis- they kind of discover it on their own by just practicing their, practicing their asses off. Um, and then you, know, you get your highs and lows, you get the awesome finale, which as a music lover was just fantastic to me. And I do think they, they um, I do recall, I forgot where, if it was on YouTube or somewhere, I, did, I do remember hearing a live recording of that, like a, a, of a concert. Hmm. Uh, and it was, I think it did feature the actresses um, playing their respective instruments. So I think, I'm not sure if they genuinely, like, like how, to what extent they've learned their instruments, but I know at least that they learn, uh, they taught, they learn how to play the instruments to perform the songs in the movie, which aren't easy songs by any means. They're pretty difficult songs to play. I mean, jazz as jazz or um, jazz as a genre itself is quite difficult to play, no matter what instrument you're playing. Mm-hmm. Um, and seeing them do that feat was 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 just was a sight to see, you know. And it was interesting because you know even with uh, with this, it has the same formula as water boys and even water boys had like you know it spawned tv dramas like it was so popular mm-hmm. it spawned tv dramas and to this day whenever yaguchi makes a new movie they always market him as the director of water boys and they yeah. also market him as the director of swing girls whenever a new movie comes you see the trailers it's like for the director of water boys and swing girls that's like the first movies like for this as a follow-up to that i thought it exceed excelled in many ways than uh, uh, in many ways, that, uh, sorry, my daughter's right here, and also my cat <laughs> excelled in many ways uh, from what Water Boys had uh, done. Yeah, absolutely mm. love Swing Girls. Yes. Now we move on to one that I think is maybe it feels a little different to me, and that is Happy Flight from 2008. Now, this one. <laughs> It's basically like everyday events that transpired during the preparation for an airplane flight and during the flight. Now this one, this one felt a little bit more information dense to me. And even though it, it kind of comes off as like a commercial for ANA Airlines, <laughs> it, it's still, it still, it still has like information that, you know, a typical person might not really know about, you know, the preparation maintenance for the plane you know, uh, the training for the flight attendants, the, you know, the pilots, uh, you know, the guy who, who clears the birds away, (laughs) like near the, the freaking, uh, the airport. And it, it felt, uh, I really appreciated it's, uh, it's information, you know what I mean? And, and how detailed it got in the whole, uh, uh, flight type, uh, process. And then it actually kind of turns into a, a suspense movie <laughs> like later mm. in the film so i felt like this this kind of uh this film it just feels like a little bit of a of a different experience and 
kind of stretched Iguchi a, a little bit further out instead of just doing the same exact thing over and over again. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think this was like pretty, it was good for him to do something like this. And uh, Haruka Ayase, uh, hey, Ray, is she on every advertisement still in Japan? I mean, you're oh, yeah. around. Yeah. On, um, oh, yeah. She's still, I forget who she's the spokesperson of at the moment. But she's still, she, you still see her in commercials and, and um, poster advertisements everywhere. She's still like an it, an it girl. She hasn't lost it yet. Okay. Yeah. When I, when I get over there uh, at some point, I'll, I'll take a look around, see if I see her around uh, the ads, but yeah, this is, uh, I, I liked, I did appreciate how he, how he mixed it up here. And um, I don't know. I just, I, this is one that I just find again, very like engaging just the way it's even from uh, the standpoint of like the missing tool that, you know, people are like running around trying to figure out like what's going on. Where, where is this, this one missing tool could cause like a problem, you know? So, hmm. but yeah, that's my feeling on this. I feel like that the, the way it engages is in its attention to detail. And there are, there are some funny scenes in it. what do you think about happy flight, Corey? Yeah, definitely a few laugh out loud moments, but there's only one or two. Uh, this is definitely a departure, fuck it, pun intended, um, from his previous films. Um, but yeah, it's def- it's definitely not as comedic. It's like you said, it's very informative. And I imagine if you're an aviation nut, you would love this movie. And I get the feeling he came up with the idea. Of this I just I've just made this story up in my head. I can just see him catching a flight somewhere one day and going, "Hmm, I wonder how this works." It's like, it's one of those moments where, you, you know, what, what does it all mean? Like the meaning of life, one of those kind of moments where he's like, oh, I'm catching a flight, you know, maybe it's like a three hour flight or something from here to here. Hmm. I wonder how this all comes together. And it's, it's almost documentary like, like it feels like he's showing you how, like how many, this, this movie's got a ton of characters, by the way. Too many, in my opinion, but I'll get onto that in a minute. There are I, every little detail is covered on just a simple flight. Um, you know, you've got the flight attendants, you've got the flight attendant on a first day, you've got even guys that do like um, that they're obsessed with like the the plane watching, and then you've got the, the tower people and the people that work at the desk, and it's like everyone. Every single person that's involved in a plane going from point A to point B, this movie focuses on. And that's part of its strength because it's fascinating. Like if you've ever flown in a plane before, you'll make you go, hmm, okay, I didn't realize this much went into just a simple flight. Um, but also I think that's part of the film's down downfall is that there are too many characters. Um, unlike his other movies where there's a, a clear main character and then there's an arc and then there's a plot. This just has, there's no real main character to to this. You've got, like I said, 50 characters. Like you've got the the stewardess that is starting her first day. You've got the one that's a bit bumbly and then she saves this guy's luggage. And then you've got her boss who's the manager. And then you've got like, there's like, three characters that um, are looking at like the, the flight force and then you've got a room full of guys and then you're like oh my god how many characters are in this movie it's like because yeah it, it it does this kind of like fascinating behind the scenes thing there are a few laugh out loud moments but then like the last act is it turns into like um, like a disaster film Almost Herbulous. like, yeah, it's like, oh, no, well, you haven't got Ray Liotta going nuts, which would make the movie amazing. Could you imagine if Ray Liotta was in yeah. this? Um, <laughs> but yeah, you, you, yeah, it kind of turns into a, like, oh, will they, won't they land the plane in the last act? Um, yeah, I, I enjoy the film. I think it's one of his weaker movies personally, um, but it is a fascinating watch just to see the behind the scenes. But anyway, what did you think, right? 
Oh, sorry, hold on a moment. My daughter is like shot, bragging how she brushed her teeth. <laughs> um, what is it? Uh, yeah, Happy Flight. I think the re- yeah, the main reason why I, I totally agree. It feels one hundred percent like a commercial for for ANA Airlines, and I think it was obviously it was done in collaboration with them. Um, and I th- honestly think the main purpose of this movie was to show just how all the, the depths that ANA goes into like it's the, into all the gears of its machine of just one general flight. Um, and it's interesting, like it does, like it almost feels like a, like the way they shout commands and strategies almost feels like a military movie at times, which kind of gave mm-hmm. it an interesting kind of um, identity. And uh, if there are any, I th- I'd say, you know, out of the, dozens of characters in this movie if anything i think the story focuses probably on the pilot who's being tested Mm -hmm. like you get the pilot he's like he fails in the very opening act he fails his uh his training but then he but then this first actual flight is his kind of like test to see if he's going to become a full-fledged pilot and then you have the stewardess on her first day and going through her ups and downs, and she, you know, she meets like a high school student who also wants to be a stewardess, and then she's like, uh... "Sorry, if you can hear that." I'm sorry. <laughs> and that's exactly what I say. Right. was going through in the movie. <laughs> it's like her up and down, her ups and downs as she was discovering, like, "Oh man, these customers are a pain in the ass." All these, like, and you know, like trying to remember every single detail, and then just how to work around, how to be flexible with all these situations. Like, and then you have the, the woman in, who works in the lobby who saves the lost luggage. I think mm-hmm. those are the, I guess the mechanic too, who, who's like under pressure from his, mm-hmm. his uh, superior. I think those are probably the main focuses with the main, main focuses on the, on the, on the former two. But yeah, like, uh, it was, I think, if anything, the spirit of Yaguchi in this movie lies in the way it's his, um, the characters are portrayed as underdogs. Like, you know, this, this pilot's trying to become, he's trying to get over his failures to become a real pilot. The stewardess is trying to, you know, she's trying to become a good stewardess. <laughs> she's trying to learn that she wants to figure out if she really wants to do it by learning the ins and outs, in, ins and outs of the job. And, uh, and also you get the spirit of teamwork. You know, you get you had teamwork in Water Boys and uh, and Swing Girls, uh, as you know, everyone's working together to accomplish a goal. And this time, it's it's done in a larger, much larger mass than any of his other films, that which, you know, in effect, kind of overcrowds the story. But um, but yeah, like in the end, um, aside from the underdog bit, it felt one hundred percent like an uh, an ANA commercial. And yeah, I think it just made them this movie just okay to me. Like it was interesting, but not at, doesn't have the same kind of magic as you would expect in a Yaguchi movie, in my opinion. All right. Well, Yaguchi took a little bit of a break. He waited four years before making his next film, and that is Robo G from 2012. <coughs> so after accidentally breaking their robot less than a week before a convention, three run of the mill technicians pay an old man to wear a robot suit and secretly play the role. So yeah, this is one, it, uh, it kind of, it's one of those films where you have like that, uh, a little lie that grows way bigger than the liars ever expected. And they have to deal with like all of the, I can't even say consequences. They just have to deal with all of the, <laughs> the nonsense that comes, uh, that comes with that. And I'll say right from the start, the ending of this film really surprised me. <laughs> I mean, I, I won't say exactly, but usually you have that like you have that moment where it's like okay you know let's uh you know let's 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 uh, take the proactive approach own up to this and then do the right thing uh, <laughs> i found it to be really refreshing ending uh i like the actress in this uh yuriko yoshitaka uh, mm-hmm. she's she was in a few movies around this time that i that i liked and then you have gaku uh, gaku hamada in the lead but uh, but yeah, this is one I uh, I I really like the uh, the uh, the comedy bits in this with the old man and just the the mm-hmm. way it, it flows through. I think uh, 
Yuriko's character, the way that she's like a real fangirl was really, really quite hilarious. And there were some moments during the second half that were, that were unexpected. So this kind of like, he kind of refocused, Yaguchi refocused back towards more similar to his template, but it didn't go, you know, it's not an exact template of water boys or, uh, or swing girls. But I think this, it just has a pleasant low key vibe with funny jokes related to robotics. <laughs> and that's why I really like it. What do you think, Corey? Yeah, definitely. I like this movie as well. Like I said, I don't think this guy's made a bad film. Uh, yeah, this is definitely, again, like you said, it's not just copying that Water Boys, Swing Girls formula. He stays in this kind of like slice of life, you know, this little thing goes wrong and then antics occur. Um, but it's, it's done in a way where he does take, he, he takes a bit from like My Secret Cash where you've got the character learning certain things. And, and in this movie, the basic premise is there's these three guys that are just, they're basically, uh, they could probably fix a washing machine, maybe, if you're lucky. And they, they somehow create the robotics program for this, this company they're working for. They know nothing about robotics. Um, they, they try to make their own robot. It doesn't work at all. Uh, and, and then they, they make like this shell and they, they hire this old man who is kind of just alone and I guess wants some kind of adventure in his life um, to be the robot. And then they get deeper and deeper. They just keep digging themselves a bigger hole. And then there's the fangirl who is obsessed with the robot because there's, there's an instance where there's this robotics fair and the robot saves her from, you know, probably being crushed to death. Um, and, uh, yeah, these these three bumbling idiots have to learn, like, mechanics and um, engineering and all these robotic techniques. And like Eric said, you, you expect these guys to have, like, a redeeming arc where they like fess up to everything and whatnot, but it doesn't really happen. And then the fangirl, what I think she, spoiler alert, she kind of discovers that it's all a sham, but what happens with her at the very end, I think is probably one of the funniest moments in the movie, to be honest. Uh, but I think this is probably one of his most underrated movies you don't hear people talk about roboji a lot and even i watched again i watched this recently for this discussion and um even when you go online it's just like it's just forgotten about like people don't really talk about it they talk about swing girls they talk about water boys they talk about wood job um but yeah this one's kind of if, if you've only seen it the once or you've never seen it i i highly recommend it um it's it's definitely better than Happy Flight, and it's one of his best films, in my opinion. It, yeah, right. Your thoughts? Yeah, uh, immediately, uh, one of those people who, uh, well, I've seen it like a while back. I haven't seen it recently, and it's one of those movies. It's probably out of Yaguchi's entire filmography, the film which I remember the least details about. But what I remember enjoying about this movie is the way. Um, they held auditions to who to who was going to be inside the suit <laughs> and the way it's they at first it wasn't going to be the old man it was going to be this dude but it turned out he was allergic to metal so they decided to call back the old man because <laughs> when his back started hurting and he started moving like Osimo, you know <laughs> like when he kind of like slouches a little bit and starts walking away it's like oh there's the robot walk right there you know it's like you had <laughs> You saw it right there. And what I liked about this movie, at least what I remember liking about this movie at the time, is that it not only combines um, dudes who are trying to learn about, you know, making robotics, but also, like, I'm a huge fan of, uh, of like, Kamen Rider, Japanese tokusatsu superheroes. And the way the, this guy puts on his suit and performs in shows, it's basically that. They actually had, like, a, I think, 
I, I'm pretty sure it was meant as a homage to that kind of that style of entertainment. They had a scene where I think he was watching a, a stage show of local superheroes going yeah. on. And then like basically everything that he was doing in the zoo was basically that, but in a different environment. Like he was performing like in, in robotic shows, but in the same kind of manner, uh, manner as what you would expect in a, a stage show of a superhero show in in Japan, where they put on their their uh, their suits and they perform martial arts. In this time, but in this case, he's doing all these robotic motions or pretending to do commands from the three bumbling idiots, and like that kind of mix mishmash of genres was what I took away from this movie. And of course, I know. Uh, Yuriko Takashi was, um, or Yoshitaka, sorry, is uh, was adorable as she always is in a movie, especially as a fangirl. And, and the way uh, she interacts with the three, I remember having a lot of fun in the way, seeing the way she reacted, she interacted with uh, the, the four guys, the three, the three workers and the, the main old guy. And uh, yeah, Unfortunately, yeah, this movie as a whole is probably the movie out of all of Yaguchi's movies I remember the least about. But I, at least that is the the stuff I said is what I took away from it and still remember to this day. Yes, yes. So after that, after Robo G, Yaguchi did not wait as long. In two years, came out with Wood Job, two thousand fourteen. After failing his college entrance test, a slacker decides to take up forestry in the hopes of meeting a cute girl on the promotional poster. So I think in this one, I think this does like a really nice job of blending the informational aspects of a happy flight and mm-hmm. like the character arcs you get from, you know, swing girls and water boys. And I think this arguably does have the best character arc for a single character in his filmography. If you look at Shota yep, Somatani 100%. at the beginning, and then you look at him at the end, he's, he's, she's changed, you know what I mean? Uh, quite a bit. Um, and I really kind of appreciated that. Uh, Masami Nagasawa is great in this. Uh, uh, and Hideaki Ito, who, an actor who oh. I wasn't like the biggest fan of back in the day until Mike directed really? him in Lesson of the Evil. <laughs> and that's when I really became a fan of him was that movie. And then he just continued a nice streak of like good flicks with this mm. one. And yeah, it's just the, the whole aspect of, of just, hey, let's make a movie about forestry. You know, it's just like, it's great. It's, it's, it's interesting. You have like the, um, the cultural aspects of that, that, that village area and, uh, you know, how they, how like the, uh, uh, the system, the ecosystem and I have to maintain it and how I really like the line when the, when the dude said, you know, um, uh, you know, a, what would he say something like uh, when you when you do something that culminates in a few years you can see the results of your work but we're we're going to be long dead before these trees end up uh you know maturing so i thought that was kind of an interesting little aspect to it but i think this is really like uh, this director kind of firing on all cylinders in terms of what he does best and uh yeah it's it's an absolute must see in my opinion when you think uh cory yeah. This is my favorite film of his by far. I love it. I think this is, he's taken everything that's come before and he's, he's sat down, he's gone, this worked and this, this worked here, and this didn't work. Actually, this worked really well. And he took everything that came before and we got wood job. Um, the, yeah, the arc is the best. Um, this young again he's a young idiot that somehow I think he's just chewing gum isn't he and he gets gum stuck on like, yeah, I think so. um, the flyer for the and, and he sees the flyer and his motivation is the pretty girl on the flyer that's it that's his motivation to to go do this you know log trees and cut down trees be a lumberjack basically and the again the slice of life stuff here is done perfectly you've got this city guy going to the country he's the fish out of water he rocks up he's in his like air jordan type shoes and he's got his like puffy jacket and all the guys that you know are locals they're just typical they're very masculine i think there's a there's quite a big uh 
difference. I, I, I think there's kind of that, I guess that um, he's kind of dissecting, you know, the young city male with like, I guess the working class village type male. And I guess that's part of the arc to this guy that probably couldn't even tie a shoelace can now cut down a tree. Um, but yeah, I, I liked the, the, I guess the love story component of this movie. There's even a supernatural, supernatural component to this mm. film, um, it, it's there slightly, but I, I get the the whole kind of I guess um, it's there throughout the whole film. I don't, and it's and it's done so well. It's not like it's beating the audience over the head where it's like climate change or mm-hmm. care about nature, environmentalism, that type of thing. It's more like, and it's you mentioned that scene earlier, Eric, where it's it's more like respect just Mm -hmm. have respect for the forest, for the environment, because these guys are cutting down these trees, but, you know, they sing their songs, they do their rituals. It it means there's a lot more involved than just like we're cutting down a tree and we're going to go get drunk afterwards. Uh, And that's carried through the town. Um, And yeah, or even the side characters, like the old, old grandmas that he talks to and, um, the wife that just wants a baby, uh, you know, it's it's he's taken that formula and he's perfected it here. Like Swing Girls, if you've not seen any of these movies, um, this is a movie I could watch any day of the week. I I, I love this film. I, I watch this film all the time. Um, it makes me feel good. It's got a great... Um, song at the end too called Happy is School which I think was done by like a Swedish uh, artist um, it's in, the song's in English it's called Happy is School and as soon as that song starts playing it's like yeah it sums up the movie perfectly um, but yeah good job unfortunate name because I've tried <laughs> to recommend this movie to quite a few people when I say I, I one of my favourite Japanese comedies is called Wood Job it's like ah I don't know if you Google wood job, you probably <laughs> might stumble on yeah. to a few. It, it, look, if you Google wood job and it leaks you, like it takes you to a link to a Pornhub video, don't say we didn't want you. Okay. <laughs> anyway, anyway, Ray, what did you think of wood job? This film, Absolutely. not the <laughs> Pornhub video. Name aside, I mean, I can see where the pun came from. I mean, Jap- the way Japanese treats English, it's kind of, you know, different. It's their, they do it in their own way. But title aside, this uh, I absolutely love this movie. I connected with this movie in a way because, like, I I kind of saw myself in Somatani's like the same kind of role. Like he's kind of he didn't really know what he wanted to do in life. He's just like bumbling along, and then he finds himself in a out of his comfort zone in the in the woods i like when i first came to japan i lived in the countryside not as rural as somatani's character but pretty rural um and just like somatani it's like you know he gets caught up in local events not just forestry but also just local events that the village uh has like festivals and stuff like that i that happened to me too and just like somatani i ended up um growing a huge love for everything that I was experiencing because I mean my where I came from in the U.S. it wasn't exactly big city it was just suburbia right but um, once I came to the Japanese countryside I went through the sim- very similar experiences that so many times character did here I am still here you know I'm in my it's going to be my 13th year in Japan <laughs> granted I am in the city now I, I'm out of the countryside but I am in the city now but that's how I connected with this movie. That's how I fell in love with this movie. It's because, you know, the way, all of the beats of uh, Somatani's arc like resonated with me because I was going through similar emotions. And then, you know, at the end, it's like, you know, he had a choice of like going back, but then he was like, like going back to his regular life. Then he chose to, he chose to come, go back to the woods, right? He chose to go back to the mm-hmm. village. And and stay and, and keep his connection there and i was like oh man this is like every expat story you know it's like like uh you get caught up you you find you don't know you're, you're getting yourself into but then you find something 
you love about it and then it keeps you there and yeah that's how i connected with uh with wood job that's why i love it too nice nice and it, fun fact i uh when i was in, in elementary school one of my buddies invited me to go up to like he had like a, a house out in like i even forgot where this was it was like out in the woods or something somewhere and i went out there just for like the weekend with him and his family so we walk up a hill his dad goes come with me let's go and i'm like okay so it's the winter we walk up a hill he drops an axe he's like go ahead cut this tree down <laughs> i was seven years old <laughs> and then he and then he leaves he's like be careful and he leaves <laughs> so so me and his son like seven-year-olds are taking turns like cutting the tree and we only did like half he said leave the leave the other half and i'll i'll, I'll knock it down just get get it started so that was a nice well, uh, at least it was an axe and not a chainsaw <laughs> yeah, yeah so now we go another two-year gap here quick uh turnaround for survival family 2016 after a worldwide electrical outage occurs, everything that requires electricity comes to a stop. So in response, a man and his family make a trek away from Tokyo in an attempt to find an area with power. Now, the only, I looked online for like interviews with this director and the only one that I could find was in relation to this film when it got released at like a film festival somewhere. And he, he seems to be like an old school kind of guy. And he thinks that like, um, you know, a lot of the modern technology nowadays making people kind of lethargic. It's kind of hurting relationships, especially like social social media and stuff like that. <clears throat> and uh, obviously we saw some of that in the Kyoshi Kurosawa film Pulse and the negative aspects of technology, something that's a backbone in Shinya Sukamoto's entire filmography. So this is kind of like a, um, I think Survival Family is a little bit of a departure because this is more of a drama to me than it is a comedy, mm. I think almost decisively. So, you know, you have this family and um, you see them go through this period where I think it pretty realistic depiction of what would happen if power went out. You know, I mean, people, you know, you end up going to like the local grocery stores, get stuff, they get wiped out. And then you end up just trying to, to have enough food just to survive the next day and, and, and that type of thing. And I think that a lot of people, uh, even me included, if you drop me in this scenario, just drop me in the middle of the woods, I'd have I'd have problems surviving personally. So it, it has that whole aspect to it. And I think that makes it really interesting. And you learn a little bit about like survival type stuff. And um, yeah, it, it, this one is definitely a little bit different for Yaguchi. And I, I did really quite enjoy it. Even like little scenes like when the blind ladies are sitting by the car tunnel. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and they're like hey we could take you through. They'll be they're back. Like, they're like nah, don't worry <laughs> they're like oh they'll be back like stuff like that's really neat so uh yeah i like this one what do you think Corey? yeah it's definitely the black sheep of the filmography i agree i 100 agree it's it's a drama um it does have comedic moments i think this film I, again i watched this the other day um I think now that we've all kind of lived through COVID and we've seen what happens when the government, you know, announces a, a lockdown and I don't know, th this film might uh, be a bit too close for home for some people if they watch it now. Because mm. uh, it was interesting watching it now after, after we've, you know, spent the last two, two plus years dealing with, with COVID and lockdowns and things and just seeing that opening where, you know, suddenly there's no power and they've got to walk downstairs and they go to the grocery store and you've got to get food. And then it, it just goes to shit like that. It's like, oh, it's like within a week, no power. And, and this, it doesn't matter that this is taking place in Japan. This could be literally anywhere in the world, in the developed world, I should say. Because if you're not in a developed country, you pr probably will survive. Um, but a developed country, any developed country, if we lost power for a week, this is what would happen. We ju we just we'd all be useless. We wouldn't have any water. We wouldn't know what to do. Um, and yeah, there's clearly a disdain for uh, technology in this film, particularly mobile phones. Um, 
and I guess this film is all about, you know, I guess the silver lining to if that actually did happen, you know, Snake Bliskin did a, didn't escape from LA and shut, shut the world down. Um, and we would have to, I guess, uh, use lack of a better term, man up a bit and just learn how to live and also learn how to love each other and help each other a bit more. Um, but yeah, this, this film, if you watch it now, there's going to be moments where there's like a moment where the, the thing is drinking water. It's not toilet paper, funnily enough. It's yeah. drinking water. Yeah. Um, <laughs> bottled water, which, you know, you think, yeah, that's the logical thing people should be like fighting for in the shopping center or the grocery store. It shouldn't be rolls of toilet paper. But for some reason, in reality, um, we all fight for toilet paper. Uh, but they're all kind of fighting for, well, not fighting, but trying to get bottled water and there's a scene where you know uh a bottle of water is stolen by a man and the son has to chase him down and then there's kind of like a, a there's a bit where you're like oh okay this person's just trying to keep their family alive as well um and then interestingly enough the family in the city they try to get to the grandfather that they want nothing to do with because he's boring old granddad who lives by the sea and he just catches fish and lives off the land and these people when they go to the villages from coming to the city they find that everyone in these like rural towns is perfectly fine you've got the the farmer who's lost his biggest problem is he's lost his pigs so he gets them to round up the pigs and then he's doing so well that the little old lady who brings him eggs i think he, he gives her some some pork. So it's like all these country folk that have this very simplistic lifestyle that don't rely on technology, if the world goes to shit, they're just fine and dandy. But us, like city folk, uh, we're screwed because we can't do anything. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, that's basically <laughs> the, the plot of the film. Um, yeah, I, I like this one. Uh, it's very different from everything else. I'm glad he made it because I think, um, you know, you don't really want to be doing the same thing over and over and mm -hmm. over. He's, we've got swing girls, we've got war boys, we've got wood job. We're kind of covered with that. So now we need to do something different. So Ray, what did you think of Survivor Family? I liked how different this movie was uh, compared to the rest of this filmography to date. Um, you know, this focuses on like, the t well, how deteriorated this, you know, this whole central family of four is, you know, and like, you know, they're all doing their own things like that is, you know, it, just like many, uh, just like a typical Japanese salary man, he's addicted to his job. Uh, wife is at home managing the stuff, managing the house business, like the cooking, you know, the bills and stuff. S the son and the daughter, they're doing their own things. They're not really close. And there's this barrier that, that connects everything, whether it's technology or whether it's just like disagreements or misunderstandings or like, like, you know, generational gaps or whatever. And then when the whole world turns to shit, when all the power goes out, um, that's how they become. That, it's, not only does society as a whole deteriorate, but their relationships kind of are mended in the process. And I thought that kind of... Um, that kind of flow what made this movie really interesting for me and just the way how society deteriorated like you you know first like all right credit cards don't work anymore so we can only take cash okay cash is like has no more value anymore so now we're trading rice and water you know mm -hmm. and then now we're like stealing you know food we're, we're, we're taking cat food from the supermarket now because <laughs> it has the same general nutrients as the kind of foods we've taken for protein I guess, according to this movie, that's what the logical is. So they're constantly eating cat food <laughs> wherever they go. And then, um, and I think didn't I think there was this one scene when the dad was like, you know, I'm going to eat this. You might get sick. I don't care. I'm hungry. And he eats it, and he ends up getting, getting this really bad case of. Oh, he, yeah, he drinks. He drinks uh, water from a river. Yeah. Ah, uh, yes, it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right. So it, it like shows how like you know, the deterioration of society on one side, but the kind of the mending of relationships on the other side, um, especially when they go, 
back into the village into the into the family's hometown i forget if it was the dad's or the mom's side of the family i forget which one but mm -hmm. um yeah i think uh it almost was like yaguchi trying to not only i don't know how do you say put in those ideas those old school those old school thinking th like thinker ideas and combine it with ideas from like for example like mad max or something like that where the world's just kind of shit and everything they're just trying to bargain for whatever or steal whatever they can you know and then uh you know and just put his own touch to it like there's still like um uh, these uh people fish out of water these city folk who are trying to make their way as best as they can without any kind of resources or trying to learn how to make their way through a world where all their where everything is taken away and not only the four central characters but also the whole world around them is like on equal terms of like just like figuring figuring how to get out of this shit and uh yeah like although it wasn't a comedy as comedic as this other work i still enjoyed it uh to say uh, as much as i did with his comedies yeah another fun fact about 15 years ago my area had an ice and snowstorm in october and the problem with that is that the leaves are still on the trees so instead of falling through we had trees just splitting in half <clears throat> from the from the snow and the ice so i had i was without power for eight days and that was that was oh. not fun <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, did you go think through a uh, survival family like level of crisis? <laughs> uh, not really. We had enough food in the house, and luckily I had a uh, my uh, my fireplace is old school, so it has stove tops on the fireplace. Oh, lovely! So I would just throw a you know throw a uh, uh, it's in a cat like food. <laughs> no, it'd be, it would, I was throw a <laughs> chili in it, and then they would heat it up on on the fireplace. Nice. So. <laughs> and now we come to his most recent film. His most recent film from 2019, Dance With Me. Kind of a comedy musical hybrid here. So after yeah. mistakenly being hypnotized, a young salary woman is compelled to sing and dance whenever she hears music. So yeah, this one, I think uh, I was really excited to, to track this one down. And I think it delivers. I really enjoyed it. Uh, the lead actress, Ayaka Miyoshi, I think is really charming. She almost seems like a, uh, almost like an adult version of Juri Ueno a little bit. But uh, I like, she has kind of like the dance scenes, her body structure is a little bit lanky. And that really yeah, helps in the dance. Lanky. Yeah, she's kind of like lanky. So she could really sell her dance moves. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I thought she was, she was really good uh, in this. And then, you know, some awesome uh, scenes. I think my two favorites are the, the restaurant scene. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then the... Uh, Swinging from the chandelier. Yeah, she was almost like a Tasmanian devil, you know. And I, I like how he yeah. structures the scenes where it's like everybody's like having fun, dancing with her. And then it cuts to the end. You're like, oh, crap. Like, that's not that's what happened. That's the reality. <laughs> and then my other favorite scene is the gangster dance off in the parking uh, garage or whatever. Mm. But yeah, this one unexpected. is, I, I really enjoy this. I think this would have been up near one of my favorites. However, the last mm. finale, the finale is not as climactic as some of his best comedies. I felt like he should have done something else with the premise in the last 20 minutes to kind of be a little bit more creative and climactic. But that's like the, my, really my only gripe with the film. What do you think, Corey? Yeah, this one's great. It's it's very musical. Um, you could argue, yes, this is him going back to the old formula, but I, I don't think that's the case. Um, obviously, you've got, I don't know how old the actress is. Um, I think she's meant to be like late 20s, the, the character at least. I get the feeling she's meant to be like, almost pushing 30 and you know all the women in the office are trying to like find a husband that kind of thing have a start a family they're all obsessed and they all love this this one guy uh, that she ended up going out on a date with which ends up at that uh restaurant 
Um, yeah, so it's kind of like this late 20s, pushing 30, I'm guessing, um, year old, like, salary woman. You know, she works in uh, this, this high-rise building. You know, she, she goes there every day. She scans her card like she's, she's just the number. Okay, she's just she's just got one of those jobs where it's like, yeah, she's just a number. Um, and when she was a kid, she wanted to be a musical. She wanted to sing. And there's a very funny scene that kind of is a flashback with why she hates musicals as an adult. And I can't say I blame her after what she went through. Yeah. Uh, but her niece, um, she looks after her niece. Her niece comes over and she takes her to this like fun fair where this hack fraud uh magician <laughs> um, puts her under hypnosis uh, whether he meant to or not we don't really know uh, and then anytime she hears music she can't stop singing or dancing and basically you've got this at that point the film kind of becomes a it's almost like a road cross-country mm -hmm. like road adventure mm -hmm. she like trip, yeah. meets her like this older woman who was working um, with the hypnotist as like an, an actor, scammer. And yeah, they just go on the, it's almost like adrenaline drive there a bit where they go on this kind of like little adventure and there's like these, you know, they run into the hoodlums and that has a funny payoff. And then they try to chase down this, um, this hypnotist all over Japan. And again, shit just, keeps going wrong um but the entire time there's uh there's just song and dance numbers and it's and it's all from the perspective of our lead character who like when she goes into these um she might just be wearing daggy clothes like jeans and a t-shirt but she starts singing the song and all of a sudden she's in a ball gown her makeup and hair is perfect and it literally turns into like a hollywood musical and then as soon as the song finishes, it's just like, oh, no, she's back to normal. Uh, it's, yeah, it's definitely, I, I didn't go into this expecting a lot because I don't really like musicals. Um, I've never been a big fan of musicals. But I think uh, what Yukichi did here is the fact that he put that spin on it where it's it's got that kind of like element of, is she hypnotized or not? Like you kind of question yourself. I found myself doing that. I don't know what what did you do when you were watching this, Eric? Did you believe that she was hypnotized? After the doctor scene, I did. Yeah. Okay. Because the doctor's but, like, "Nah, you're not hypnotized." And then her phone went yeah. on, and then he's like, "I think we need to start some Maybe treatment." You are. But that that, yeah. that kind of tilted me a little bit more towards the. The yeah. actual hypnosis, but, but it could time, be not big, as well. Yeah, no, you you could interpret it that way because yeah. you're like before you get to that doctor scene, you kind of like maybe she's just want you know it's that yeah. like they even they even talk about that like it's mm -hmm. you want this so much that you actually believe it, and that's why True. people go to hypnotists. So maybe that's yeah. maybe that just sets something off, and you know this film has a really good journey. You go on the journey with this woman and. She decides she gets this dream job. She could have her dream husband, where it's kind of hinted at that he might have, he might be a bit of a sleaze bag. Yeah. Um, so she dodges a bullet there, and then she kind of just decides to uh, do something in her life that's meaningful and something that brings her joy and passion. Um, and again, this is a movie that leaves you with a smile, and you could easily just hit rewind and start the whole thing again and have a great time. So, Ray, your thoughts on, on Dance With Me? Uh, I liked it a lot. I saw it in the theaters. Um, I love musicals, first of all. So this, <laughs> so I naturally, um, this naturally resonated with me as well. Um, I, love all, I loved all the dance numbers. I loved how, like, as you guys have already mentioned, that you see the, the Hollywood, the, the Broadway number through her perspective. And then once the, movie, once the music stopped, and once the trance is over and we're back into the real world, you see the real world ramifications of what just happened. Like in the first, I think mm. the very first, not, not the first scene was with the janitor 
mm-hmm. equipment, right? The yeah. second one was when yeah, she was in her she... office mm-hmm. and she was yeah. like just on the table, just kicking like documents off, like everyone's paperwork <laughs> off. And it looked like everyone's like, yeah, having a good time. And then once the music's over, everyone's like looking at her, it's like, what the hell? It's like, this is our What's work. This crazy woman doing. What's this crazy woman doing? And then this, this, the restaurant scene was amazing. Like once you see, like I think that that was added to the fun. It's like you wanted to know what what actually was happening. Like okay, like we saw the ramifications of the office scene. What what's going to happen in this restaurant? You know, and <laughs> the result of that was hilarious too. I absolutely love the gang scene because like um, mm. like for a while I like I took up dancing too. You know, like uh, friends with a lot of uh, folks who who b boy back in the day, who popped. You know, did dance battles and stuff. So that also, like, I was like, oh man, this is the, they're not about to start a gang fight. This has got to be something else. Knowing this, and it, I was like, oh man, this is a dance battle. Hell yes! So it, when they went into that scene, I was like, okay, this is this is fantastic. They they got the cars. They opened up the oh, trucks. The sound systems in those yeah. cars yeah, are very like, impressive. It was so. <laughs> It was just like it was ridiculous. I, I was like, yes, yes, yeah. This this movie has me. This movie has me. And then, even from the beginning, it's like the hypnotist is played by Akira Takarada from Godzilla. It's like how it's mm. like it's like you know you get like you get this guy playing this quack of a of a hypnotist, and he's like, oh dude, it's like I've grown up with you. It's like I don't know, it, 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 like just seeing. Just seeing um, Takarada playing this weird, like, kooky, mag- fake magician hypnotist was also really funny for me. And the whole road trip adventure was a lot of fun. Um, and just everything they want. I mean, yeah, whatever, like, as with other, I don't know, Yoguchi movies, just all the, all the misadventures along the way. That's what, you know, that, that, that's the kind of formula that made Yoguchi memorable to me and it's nice to see him kind of go back uh, not go back but kind of use those in his you know be in his element in this movie and add in some musical numbers to it and they kind of put that make that use that as a twist uh on this movie like as far as like giving it a, giving this movie its own identity um yeah like yeah absolutely loved it nice so <clears throat> Let's do the rankings now. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start with Ray this time. We'll go uh, counter here. Ooh, so right. we're going with Ray. So Ray, what what do you think if you had to like I don't know you could either do tiers or rank rank whatever you think like your favorites and least favorites of this director's films. What do you think? Well, I got like uh, you want me to go through the whole like the whole ten because I have sure. a number ten. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So my number ten was down the drain. Um, I mean, it's, it's not a bad movie. It's just that it was my least favorite out of all his movies, um, especially because of that final act. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, number nine, my secret cash. You know, because it was still like I, I enjoyed it, but he was still trying to get you know find his feet. Uh, eight was Happy Flight, um, just because it was, you know, it felt like a big commercial for ANA, as I said earlier, but it still had his touch, but. It was still like, you know, more. I felt more commercial than Yaguchi for just for me. Uh, number seven was Robo G, um, just because probably owing it just to the fact that I only watched it once years ago, and I remember very few details about it. Maybe if I watched it again, my opinion, my, my ranking would change. Uh, six was Adrenaline Drive, because I, I really liked the whole uh, the like running away with the money from the Yakuza story and all the misadventures along the way. Uh, five was Survival Family. You know, it was right in the middle. It's like not my favorite, not my least favorite, but just right in the middle. Um, number four was Dance With Me. Um, it's up there because, you know, like I said, I love musicals. I love uh the music that's featured in this movie too, and all the different scenarios that they put the characters through. Um, number three, Water Boys. First love of Yaguchi, but I think the next two movies on this list are what really kind of are my absolute favorites for him. Mm. Number two is Wood Job. You know, number two is Wood Job. 
because I, as I mentioned earlier, I love this movie because it, I feel like it tells a very similar story to what I experienced. And for me, number one is Swing Girls because as a music lover, as someone who plays an instrument and, and as someone who loved Water Boys, the, the formula that Water Boys had to see it kind of perfected in the swing in Swing Girls and also being one of the first movies of Yoko Chi I watched, Swing Girls is just like solidified as my number one. So All that's right. That's a, I approve of that of that ranking, Ray. I that's approve a of it. Very good list. I'm what about you, Corey? I'm going. Um, it's almost identical. <laughs> um, number ten is Down the Drain. Uh, again, I think this is a. I, I think I should say. Um, we. I, I don't want to speak for all of us, but I think we can all agree. And I've mentioned this. I don't think any of these films are bad. Just because I'm saying. I think down the drain is like number 10. Um, it doesn't mean that I necessarily like hate it. All right. I don't hate any of these films. I actually, there's something I like about all of them. And to be fair, depending on my mood, some of these are interchangeable. Um, I might mm-hmm. swap them around. So this isn't really a definitive list. It's very similar to Ray's. So we've got down the drain at 10. Uh, my Secret Cash or The Secret Garden at nine. Like I said, when we discussed the film, I don't find that protagonist very likable. Um, uh, eight is Happy Flight, exactly what Ray said. It's, very, it's a very interesting film. Um, but again, it does feel like a bit of a commercial, but it, there is stuff that's in there that's good. Um, some of the characters are great but no, a little bit convoluted. Uh, the next one I have is seven, and that is Adrenaline Drive. Um, again, this is a very good film. It's a product of its time. It's very 90s. Uh, six, I have Survival Family, which you know I think Ray had that at five, but I've got it at six. So it is, it's, it's the middle ground. It's one of those weird ones because it's so different from everywhere, all the other ones on the list. So you kind of like, could be, it could be seven, it could be six, it could be five. It, it just floats around that mid range. Uh, uh, number, I'm up to number five now, aren't I? Number five is uh, Robo G. I think this is, like we discussed, it's one of the less talked about films. And, you know, Ray just saying like, even though Ray has only seen it once, he you re- remembered pretty much most of the plot, though, and you remembered parts of it. So it's even if you watch it once, it's still quite memorable. Uh, four is Dance With Me. Again, great musical. And I've got to say, it did hold my attention because I think the lead actress is one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen in my life. So I'm just going to throw that one out there. Uh, three is Border Boys. Like Ray, this is my introduction. Um, It does have a soft spot in my heart. I think this is the formula. uh, Well, this is the first use of the formula and it's done really well. Now, here's my dilemma. I could tie these two, Swing Girls and Woodjob. um, But I've got to say, Swing Girls is my number two. And wood job is my number one because that's how I feel right now. Yeah. Um, but if you ask me this in a week's time, I might swap those around. Like in all honesty, these like top three, I think they can yeah just change around. Even like the top five of my list, are, like depending on my mood, it could be. I don't think dance with me would ever be um, number one, but it might move up one, and then it might move down two. I don't mm-hmm. know. This is, this is the issue with such a great filmmaker. You've got, you've, you've got to have a list, and yeah, that's my 10. And what mm-hmm. are you going to end with, Eric? What do you got for us? I did mine in tiers, like a tier list. Okay. Because it's really tough to order these, I thought. Like, really it tough. Is. It's very hard. So I have four tiers. Bottom tier is down the drain, and it has its own yep. tier. <laughs> the next tier up 
And all these movies, I think, are actually very good. All, all four of these. I got Happy Flight, My Secret Cash, Adrenaline Drive, and Survival Family in that next tier up. Mm-hmm. And then you have the second highest tier, which is Robo G, Dance With Me, and Water Boys. And then mm-hmm. the, the highest tier, the, the, the absolute highest is Swing Girls and Woodjob. Now, if I had to choose, somebody, somebody forced me, I might give Swing Girls just the edge a little bit, a little bit, but uh, it's a tough call. It keeps, uh, Woodjob's no joke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But overall, I think this director is really, uh, really fantastic. And a lot of uh, uh, fans of cinema in the West don't even know this guy. No. Uh, you know what I mean? So I, I would really like to see at least some type of like tricked out uh, physical media or at least some streaming releases for some of these in, in America it would be really nice. Now, like I'd say a majority of his films are on physical media in either Hong Kong or Japan, which can get kind of expensive um i know that dance with me needs a release with subs because i i had to buy a bootleg of that one like i couldn't uh for my collection but it's heartbreaking uh, having to do stuff like that yeah but so if anyone from like arrow films is watching or yeah. comes across this can you please just buy the rights to these and release them as a box set oh um because people need yeah if, if you like japanese cinema and you haven't seen any of these films then you really need to get onto them. Yes. But I don't blame you because a bunch of these films have, none of these films, not one, has had a release uh, in Australia, like as a physical media. Mm-hmm. Like I've seen a bunch of these in the cinema, like, what, like Japanese film festivals and things like that. But I've had to import uh, Wood Job, Swing Girls, Waterboy, Robo G, uh, Dance With Me I can't get because it doesn't have mm-hmm. English subs and it's only on Japanese DVD. Adrenaline Drive I think might have a US DVD. US DVD. Am I right? mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Survival Family, I have, I have not purchased that yet, um, but I've, the only place that's available with English subs is Hong Kong. Mm-hmm. Uh, Down the Drain and um, My Secret Cash, I think I watched on YouTube. And Happy Flight... I've never seen a physical release. No. So I don't condone pirating, but I do understand if you really want to watch these films and that's the only way. Uh, but unfortunately, they've never been released on, on Netflix or anything like that. Uh, there is a remake of Waterboys from China that came out <laughs> oh, no. last year. I didn't even know about oh, this. No. Oh, yeah. There's a remake. And there's a Chinese remake of Waterboys, and I have not watched it. No, okay. do, I, I never intend on watching it. I've not even seen, like, there's a couple of, there's like a, is there two seasons of the TV show? Like the spin off? Yeah, two seasons, yeah. Yeah, I've not it's, seen any of that. I haven't either. either. So, um, yeah. yeah. This is one of my favorite directors. So, hopefully, he gets mm. some, some, some more exposure because he deserves it. But uh, yeah. any any other well, he definitely, thoughts? Definitely has ex- he definitely has exposure in Japan if he's made if he keeps yeah. making movies. It's just it's true. every everywhere else in the world doesn't seem to care. But it's 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 quite funny. And we were talking about this earlier. There's plenty of you know just because we're talking about a Japanese director. Like I can name you a bunch of Sono films or a bunch of Mike films or you know you can just pull a director out of your hat and just think you know, like, you can say this movie is objectively bad. Like, all these movies are bad. Mm-hmm. But this guy, I don't think he's made a bad movie. Like, for the most part, this is a very impressive filmography. Yeah. Like, even if you look at, like, just filmmakers in general, like, you take somebody like Bong Joon-ho, his filmography is flawed. Um you know, Park Chan Wook or Kim Ji Woon going onto Korean directors, it's like those guys have blips, mm-hmm. several blips in their careers. But this guy, you're like, I know we 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 said down the drain has its issues, but that was a no budget in the movie. Yeah. It's like it's just it's such an impressive filmography, and he should be very proud of himself for, for making these films. Yeah, the only Japanese directors I can think of off the top of my head that are this consistent 
might be uh, Hirokazu Koreeda and Shinya Sugimoto mm-hmm. for me at least. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, um, but yeah, yeah, very consistent. Any final thoughts, Ray, on this director? Um, I'm just disappointed that he hasn't released a movie since 2019. That was <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like uh, I'm not sure. Like there hasn't been any news about COVID. coming. Pro- yeah, probably, yeah, that's true. There hasn't been any news of upcoming projects concerning him. Um, but then again, th- there's been little announcements in the past couple of years regarding new movies, and any new movies have been consistently getting been getting pushed back. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's getting better over the past year. You know, theaters are. You know, we're not we. Right now, we don't have any state of emergency right now, so theaters are operating as normal. Uh, I think as of probably middle of last year, theatrical releases have been starting to just become regular again, uh, like new movies every weekend and stuff like that. But yeah, so just waiting for the next Yaguchi movie and see what kind mm. of uh, what kind of what kind of uh, new ways he can use his magic and. and types of different types of situations you know I'd love to see him tackle um you know just put put his own spin on any any genre you know hell even the tired zombie genre i want i wouldn't mind yeah. see how he or an action like, film or sci-fi film. science yeah science yeah. fiction it's like anything really like put his magic on like you know do what it be experimental like what they did with survival family and you know uh, even with Dance With Me, he made like a, a musical. I mean, Swing Girls is, you know, in its way a, a musical too, but not in the same way Dance With Me was. Mm-hmm. Dance With Me kind of poked fun at the genre in its own way or had fun with the genre with its own way. I wanted to see him do, do it with all sorts of genres. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, just waiting for the time when we can see another Yaguchi movie uh, to be released. Yes. Yes. So any other, any, anything else you guys want to talk about or uh, are we, are we good to go here? No, I think we're good to go. I think we would, we covered that quite well. We yes. should do this again. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's other directors probably we not, could definitely prob- cover. Probably not as, um, yeah, as rarely as we have been doing. I've got more free time now, but now that this movie's in pre-production, uh, post-production, so yeah, definitely. There's all kinds of stuff we could do. directors you guys want to talk about, we could go through it. Yeah. Well, for sure, for sure. I'm always down. Yeah, we'll keep we'll keep in touch in our secret uh, discussions and yes. find other other good stuff. Yeah. So, I hope everybody secret enjoyed base. this one. I hope it was informative, and it's we covered a director who, who needs more more love. So, hopefully, if you have a chance, check out some of this guy's movies. It's worth watching. And as always, I will see you next time. <laughs>